All right, uh, it is 10.32. I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off. Uh, welcome everyone, thank you for being with us. Uh, we appreciate your time, uh, appreciate your attention to this, to this topic. It's an important topic. Uh, administrative law is a, uh, it's an issue that, that, that really involves all kinds of dynamics. It, it involves sovereignty, it involves a separation of powers. Increasingly, it involves things like federalism uh, as well at the national level. It really is intricately uh, related to much of what we do and touches on some very, very foundational issues in American government and in our state government. So we're pleased to uh, host the topic, uh, to host an event on this topic today. So for those of you who don't know, the Thompson Center has been around for a number of years now, about five years uh, in total. And we are dedicated to uh, addressing some of Wisconsin's biggest policy challenges to follow the legacy of Governor Thompson, bring people together uh, to try to resolve some of Wisconsin's greatest challenges. Uh, we do so in his spirit, which is with energy, vigor, optimism, and also uh, opening up the table uh, for seats for everyone so that we can have a broad array of perspectives because we know that working together, we can accomplish anything in this state. So we're proud to host this topic today on uh, Act 21 and where we are today. Uh, the courts uh, have not really given us a whole lot of uh, direction on what Act 21 is, where it comes down on issues, how it controls. Uh, there is a current case before the state Supreme Court where Act 21 is squarely at issue. I think some of our speakers today will talk a little bit about that case, talk about Act 21 and how it applies, perhaps how it doesn't. So uh, having said that, I am uh, pleased to have our, our speakers. I will announce them before I do that. Uh, I just want to give a very, very uh, warm thank you uh, both to the staff at the Thompson Center, Eric Templis, who is the assistant director, and Tia Westhoff, uh, who is the assistant, uh, the administrative assistant here. They do a bang up job. Uh, as always, we appreciate their help. And I want to thank all of our uh, guests here, uh, Ryan Walsh, uh, uh, Professor uh, Marjorie Sarver Thompson, Ben Kennard, and of course, Justice uh, Janine Geske. Thanks everyone for being here. I am excited about this. I'm sure you are as well. I am now going to turn it over to Eric Templis, the assistant director. He's going to kick us off. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'm pleased to introduce Marjorie Sabar Thompson. Uh, she's a professor of political science at Wayne State University in Detroit. In 2019, she completed with Dr. Like Thompson a 50-state study of legislative oversight of the executive branch, um, which is exactly the issue we're talking about today. Now, it's not going to, to deal specifically with Act 21, but you'll see the tangential relationship of her research across the 50 states to what's going on in Wisconsin. Um, so with that, I'm pleased to introduce uh, uh, Marjorie to us today. Hi, um, I'm going to share my screen and launch into some slides here. And uh, then hopefully um, we'll be in good shape. Um, uh, whoops, let's see. We already tried this screen sharing stuff so that I make sure I do it right. Here we go. Um, I assume that everybody is seeing uh, something that says um, bipartisan solution driven state legislative oversight of the executive branch? Yes. Good, great. Um, so um, this is a, about a thousand page report um, I'm just gonna make sure, am I uh, proceeding on the slides so that it's uh, showing moving slides forward for you? So Marjorie, it's if you want a slideshow, um, I think it should allow you to click for it to turn into a slideshow. Okay, let me see. I thought I had it, but uh, probably I didn't. Okay, so it says resume slideshow. Um, from the beginning. Maybe I'm sharing the wrong screen. Hang on just one second. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, at, as I told everybody, uh, my classes will tell you that I sometimes am not the greatest on getting the right screen shared. Uh, does that look better? We now have uh, bipartisan solution driven and then we move to state legislative oversight. Excellent. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, sorry about that. Um, my students sympathize with you. <laughs> so basically uh, we looked at state legislative oversight over all 50 states and it's an important topic because increasingly, especially you know, from the 80s and 90s onward, states have delivered a lot more money, federal programs pass through money. 
Um, and in the 90s, they started also uh, using private contractors to deliver public money. And the public money needs to be spent carefully, obviously. And there have been a history of some really awful scandals. We discovered some really horrifying ones that involved deaths and, and all sorts of, of physical harm. So basically what we did was look at all 50 states. We tried to give ourselves a crash course in every single state government, which was a tall order. Um, we obviously had a lot of help, uh, lots of graduate students and my colleagues. We looked at the chamber rules, we read those, we read parts of the state constitutions, we looked at the websites, uh, they're typically in most legislatures are different websites for the analytic support agencies, the auditors perhaps, the fiscal agency staff, etc. cetera. Uh, we looked at any sort of auditor general, even if they weren't um, necessarily appointed by the legislature, some states elect them, um, Sometimes we have governors who appoint them in some states. There's a wide array across the states. Um, and then we tried to find out what other uh, staff resources the states have and use to exercise oversight over the, the legislative oversight over the executive branch. We listened to lots of committee hearings. Um, if lots of states record them. Lots of states have committee hearings going back several years archived publicly available. We looked at state media reports uh, for scandals and crises, and then tried to link them back to whether or not the legislature had done some investigation. And then we tried to, to kind of double check ourselves by calling staff and legislators and media sources in the state to try and make sure that we had gotten the, the details it, it right. Um, so basically the things that we contribute from the report are a series of best practices. And in this big thousand page report, um, which is blessedly uh, has, has the table of contents on a PDF so that you can click through it, there is an appendix of best practices for state legislative oversight. And what we found that a lot is that a lot of states may be really supercharged on one type of state legislative oversight and really have either very limited powers or lag in their use of other oversight tools. So it looks like to us that states could learn a lot from looking at each other's practices. So to contribute to that, we're here to, to hopefully help some of you in Wisconsin get the ball rolling on that. Um, basically, we assessed the um, overall capacity of each state legislature in terms of the tools that it had available. And then we also assess them in terms of the use of those tools. And from that, we produced a 50 state ranking, like one to 50. The two top states nationally, sort of overall, um, were Nevada and Colorado. In the Midwest, um, the, the higher performing states were Minnesota, Ohio, Illinois, and then Wisconsin was up there toward the top. They received a 14, of rank overall on having the tools to do oversight, but actually they make really good use of the tools that they do have because they ranked 11th on use of the tools. Um, I'll go into some of those different tools shortly. Um, we ranked state performance on six specific categories and those rankings we did a, as just categorical rankings um, and the, the categories were minimal, limited, moderate and high. So in a couple places, you're gonna see that uh, Wisconsin got a limited score, but that's actually better than minimal by quite a bit. Um, and basically we looked at this um, in terms of, is there a tool or is there a resource that's adequate for legislators to conduct this specific type, one of these six specific categories of oversight? Do they have the tools or those staff resources to do it, and then do they actually do it? And is it in a nonpartisan solution-driven manner? Um, and we, we gave demerits for highly partisan use of oversight tools. We are, after all, um, from the Levin Center at Wayne State. And if you know anything about Senator Carl Levin, he prided himself on conducting a very nonpartisan, collaborative across the aisle oversight. And so the mission of the Levin Center um, is to try and find ways to encourage the, um, the sort of more 
nonpartisan public service, public stewardship approach to oversight. So the six specific categories that we rated were things like the performance audits, the staff resources, um, and the audits that we were looking for, these performance audits focus on service delivery and service quality, not just the financial audits. A lot of states have auditors who do like accounts receivable, accounts payable, all of that sort of stuff. Some states actually have zero, none, nothing in the performance audit area. Some states actually do not have an auditor general um, or they don't have one that reports to the state legislature at all. There's no relationship there. Um, the committee hearings, uh, I'm sorry, we rated uh, Wisconsin high. You have a very good audit agencies, very good staff, uh, very productive. They produce good high quality performance audits. The committee hearings, we also rated Wisconsin as high. Um, we looked for whether state agency officials were called in directly to testify, whether the audit reports were discussed in uh, committee hearings, uh, whether there was any examination of the agency officials or the findings of the audit reports by the committee members. We actually rated the quality of the questions because particularly in, in term limited states like my own, um, you can have some very naive questions from legislators that, yes, they're asking questions, but ones that one might assume a state legislator ought to know the answer of. Wisconsin did very well. Your, your legislators were well prepared. They did a good job in the committee hearings. We also looked at the budget and appropriations process. This is clearly the power of the purse is a very powerful tool um, for state legislative oversight of the executive branch. And we looked at the, the fiscal staff and the support, the use of the uh, appropriations committee to, to refer back to audit findings, to inquire whether agencies had done something to fix the problems and willingness to use some either budget cuts or sometimes budget increases in situations where the agency didn't have the resources and legislators understood that if they expected a particular function to be carried out, they were going to have to fund it. Um, and uh, Wisconsin did a moderately good job on that, next to the highest category, but um, not quite as strongly as a, a Colorado or a Nevada. Um, administrative rule review, which is clearly of interest uh, to people this morning, uh, Wisconsin rated as high on that. Um, that means that you have powerful tools. The legislature can have impact on the rules that state agencies promulgate. Um, most states have some procedure for feedback about these rules, but this is a, an area where the variance is really wide across the states. There are some states, West Virginia is, is sort of the extreme example, in which the state legislature can look at rules that have been negotiated um, you know, by the state agency and, and other actors in the system. And they can just plain flat out say, we don't like that rule, we're rewriting it. And they write the administrative rule and that's the end of it. Um, and so then you also have states where they have almost no power. Um, they can ask for a delay or they can ask that the um, state agency take another look at the rule, but they really have very limited opportunities. My own state of Michigan um, lost a lot of its um, administrative rule review power back in the 90s in a Supreme Court decision uh, when uh, John Engler was our governor. Um, then we also looked at advice and consent. Um, back in the time period when we were looking at this, COVID was not a thing yet. And so advice and consent focused on things like vetting gubernatorial appointees. Now, if we were redoing this, we would spend a lot of time obviously looking at gubernatorial executive orders. Um, and, but advice and consent uh, was something that we rated Wisconsin as limited. Um, and from that standpoint, what we're looking for often is particularly in same party situations where you have the same party in the legislature and in the governor's office, um, does anybody actually vet those employees, uh, uh, the, those appointees, sorry. Um, and 
often we would read back through scandals that were reported in the state media and you would wonder why somebody didn't challenge the appointment of somebody who later turned out to be problematic for the state. And uh, a lot of states uh, have only limited interviewing of these gubernatorial appointees. Um, then we are starting right now, actually we're currently working on a, an additional add-on uh, to the oversight of state contracts. Uh, we rated Wisconsin as limited in this, but that's actually a good score because almost all states got minimal. There were only a handful, uh, like 10 or fewer, of the states that we rated even limited. And I think there was only one state that got a moderate score. Nobody got a high score on that one. And part of that is that a lot of states are just now developing laws that provide the legislature with some additional power so that they can go in and ask for the private vendor to appear before a committee hearing, or they can get uh, more information, but their audit um, agencies, the legislative auditor can go audit the vendor directly. A lot of states are doing a workaround where they audit the state agency and then as an indirect effect of that, they're able to get some information about the con contract. So that's sort of a future um, research. So basically performance audits are the key to having any ability to do um, legislative oversight of the executive branch. And the, the states that lack the performance audits are really having problems with this. Um, other states have a lot of different kinds of auditors and often there are audits available. Sometimes they're more accessible to the legislature, sometimes not. But the key difference we found was whether the audit reports were actually used. Um, I'll pick on my own home state. Um, Michigan has an award-winning audit agency. They produce about 30 performance audits per year. They're really top-notch audits. I've read many of them. And in the study period that we looked at, there were only three hearings and only in one chamber and none, no hearings at all in the other chamber on any of those 30 audit reports. And some of those were very serious audit findings and some of them were things that the audit agency itself was not able to get compliance except voluntarily from the agency, whereas the legislature could pass a law and require compliance. Um, so we, we, some of the best practices that we feel it appear to increase the use of performance audits are laws that actually require that each state have a public hearing on a performance audit. Both Colorado and the state of Washington have that. And there's a slide in a few minutes about a ballot initiative that was passed in the state of Washington. Um, people often argue that the public doesn't care that much about um, legislative oversight or oversight of the agencies or oversight of service delivery. Um, Washington is a ballot initiative state and they had a citizen initiative that they passed to require public hearings, to require legislative uh, reports on the actions taken, and they funded it. They actually provided tax revenue. So I'm not convinced that citizens don't care about this. I think they actually do when it's explained to them. Uh, some states list the actions that the legislature took on any problems identified in the audit reports in, in a collection, you know, end of session report where it says, you know, audit report, audit findings, legislative action, you know, bill introduced, bill passed out of X committee, bill proceeded to opposite chamber, you know, dates when things passed, dates when things sign were signed into law, or if it stalled in one of the chambers. Um, you know, and it's a, a publicly available report, very easy to figure out what the legislature is doing with the audit reports. Another best practice we found is joint chamber committees, and Wisconsin has several of these, so we commend you on that. Um, the, these are a lot more efficient for the audit agency staff. I've observed committee hearings where the audit agency staff presented an audit report, and some of these are lengthy. They were like two full days of hearings, of legislative hearings. Um, 
and they presented it to six or seven committee members and then they turned right around and presented the exact same thing to six or seven uh, committee members from the other chamber. Um, that's awfully inefficient. It's also back in the days when we used to have more split control between legislative chambers, a way to encourage bipartisanship on the, um, the oversight committees, uh, the committees that are hearing these audit reports. Minnesota is currently the only state legislature in the country where the two chambers aren't controlled by the same party. But um, back, in, back in prior times, which I'm old enough to remember, that used to be fairly common. And it contributed to something that we found that we actually were really surprised by. Um, and this is more common in the Rocky Mountain states, less common in the Midwest, which I'm more familiar with, and I assume many of you are too. But there is 13 states in the United States where the state legislature requires equal party membership on a particular oversight committee. Sometimes it's a rules committee and a general oversight committee, um, sometimes just one or the other, but what they do is balance the party membership on that committee only. Other standing committees, it's the standard procedure of the majority party has more seats on the committee, but um, these are really efforts to ensure that the minority party has a voice in oversight. Um, and it, it really seems to cut down on the use of these committees as a sort of partisan football to play gotcha politics on things. And uh, the other thing um, we have been told that balanced party membership can provide a little cover for member of the members of the governor's party if they actually would like to criticize the governor. Um, and so the, you know, the, the minority made us do it. Um, so um, someplace like Idaho, which has become a poster child for our contract monitoring study, um, it's mandatory that you have three Republicans and three Democrats from the lower chamber, three Republicans and three Democrats from the upper chamber on their oversight committee. At the time that we were looking at them, they had a total of six Democrats in the entire lower chamber. And I'm always mystified about what they're gonna do when they don't have three Democrats in the lower chamber. But um, it is a legal requirement that they have to do that. Um, some part-time legislatures, we were really amazed at how diligent they are about oversight. And they, what they do is appoint an interim committee um, to follow up on the audits. And these interim committees um, meet in the summer, um, obviously full-time professional legislatures, you don't technically have an interim committee, but we sort of theorize that you could create a task force or something that might simulate this. But they're responding to a specific problem in an audit report. They meet outside the Capitol, they stay in a hotel, um, they have, you know, site visits and field trips and all of that sort of thing. Um, and uh, nothing else competes with their time and they, they get acquainted with each other. Um, and they're very successful in doing oversight. So um, I just had mentioned previously the uh, Washington State Initiative. Um, so I'll, I'll, if people want to share the slides, you can read the details. So some of the bipart, uh, some of the uh, rule review committees are also bipartisan, but the key thing I would like to highlight is that we found that the better administrative rule review systems consider the benefits of the rules. Almost everybody looks at costs, but there also are benefits, and that's said by somebody who um, is in a state where we're paying the costs of the Flint water crisis, um, so protecting the public health can um, be a valuable thing to do. Um, so we've looked a little bit at gubernatorial actions. COVID wasn't a thing back then. And so we really didn't have much on executive orders because they're often in crises. Um, the, the current debate over decisions to reopen states, again, we would caution against politicizing the risk of public health, but it does seem qualitatively different than um, the other sorts of things. So just to highlight your strengths, joint chamber, 
legislative committees, strong, well-resourced audit and finance, finance staff, uh, an independent audit agency, the things we would recommend that you do is increase public access to committee hearings. Uh, we found only some of your committee hearings on Wisconsin Eye, and it's very easy. States, many states just buy software packages and they're up on the legislative website. Uh, we have heard that Wisconsin Eye um, may even have less options for providing that support in the future. So that's something we would recommend. And then consider ways of getting equal partisan representation on the committees. And this is consistent with things that we would recommend that other states do. But most we would recommend that you share your experiences across the state. We invite you to look at the links for the full report. As I said, it's a thousand pages, but Wisconsin's a bit shorter than that. And we thank you for listening. Thank you, Marjorie. Now, at this point in time, we'll ask uh, Tia to, to flash the um, code that you're going to use if you're pursuing CLEs for this session. And there are three codes. This is the first of them for the, the webinar today. Okay, and if anyone has any questions, we have about two minutes before the next session. Marjorie is sure that she'll stick with us for um, the pendency of the webinar, so she could perhaps answer questions later in the webinar if any arise. Um, but feel free to submit questions on the Q&A function. So Marjorie, just a quick question while we're waiting. Uh, what, what prompted uh, your research team to explore this topic? As I looked around, um, there weren't a lot of studies across the 50 states, but yours jumped out as being one of them. Yeah, I, we discovered that it's a very under-researched topic when we were trying to look for things to help us get started. When the Levin Center <coughs> set up their operations in uh, the Wayne Law School, they wanted to start offering trainings to other state legislatures uh, to help them learn better techniques for state legislative oversight. And uh, as a state legislative scholar, I was asked to, to comment on, you know, what would be good to have in the trainings. And I basically said, I think we need to back up because there really isn't anything, as you're saying, available about what the states do. And we need to go out and find out what they actually do my personal preference actually is more to, to set up seminars and collaborative exchanges between the states. And I actually, my bias being a state legislative scholar, um, is that I think the states could teach the federal government a lot. Um, there are some states that I found just amazingly good at state legislative oversight. Um, and, and I would love to see our federal system <laughs> look more like their system than it does, especially right now where we have a lot of gridlock and a lot of partisan bickering. Excellent. And we'll, we'll take one more question. Uh, first, first, the question from Connie O'Connell. Um, feel free to submit the codes at the end. So hold on to each of the codes. And then at the end, you can submit them on the Google form. One last question before we move uh, to the next segment. Um, you know, in the next five or 10 years, I know you looked at the past prior four or five decades in your research. Do you expect to revisit this topic again, again with research? Um, and, and Wendy Scattergood asked, will you be examining executive orders in the future, including COVID orders? Um, the Levin Center itself has looked at uh, some of the emergency procurement um, actions by governors. So they're continuing with that. Um, it, we are, we've kind of launched off um, in the direction of the state contract monitoring um, be, because we found such an alarming lacuna in, in state practices. And we had a lot of state legislature, legislators, we would listen to committee hearings and they would express their frustration in their discussions in the committee about how do we get information on that? It seems like we should have the power to call in people 
and grill them on that. And, and they were left in a situation where they were firing a director of a state agency because the state agency wasn't closely monitoring the contract of a private vendor, but the private vendor was the one who was actually committing actions that in a couple of cases led to the death of children and, and teens um, in, in some pretty horrific situations. And they had, they really had huge frustration about how do we get at this? Several states are passing laws currently on this. Very good. Well, we'll shift focus. Thank you, Marjorie, for that update on uh, oversight by the legislative branch of the executive. I think it's really an interesting 50 state overview and the specific uh, uh, survey that you did of Wisconsin and its um, ranking, I think is very helpful as a baseline. So I'm pleased to now uh, to bring forward Justice Janine Geske. She's a distinguished professor of law at Marquette University Law School. She's the director of the law school's restorative justice initiative. Um, as many of you know that are on here, she's a former justice on the Supreme Court in Wisconsin. Uh, prior to that, she served in a variety of other roles in government. So I appreciate uh, Justice Geske being with us and she will introduce her panel today. Thank you. All right, I think I'm, I'm connected now. Um, I'm, I'm excited about being part of this discussion today because I think it's so relevant um, as we look at our political wins, what's happening both in our local state and federal governments and how um, the administrative regs play a role in the rollout and administration of our justice system and also um, our government systems. And we have two wonderful speakers who are going to help enlighten us on the topic, particularly um, looking at some specific examples. The first person I'm introducing is um, Ryan Walsh. He's partner at Eimerstahl LLP. He's former Wisconsin Chief Deputy Solicitor General former law clerk on the U.S. Supreme Court for the Honorable Anton Scalia, and former law clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit for the Honorable Diarmuid O'Scanlan. The second person that I'm introducing is Ben Conrad, attorney at law at Von Briesen and Roper in Milwaukee, and author of Wisconsin Supreme Court Certifies DNR Regulatory Authority Cases in a former assistant attorney general for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. They're both going to give us some background um, in this area to take a look at uh, chapter 21 and also take a look at administrative law and how it interacts, um, particularly focusing on a case that's pending before the Wisconsin Supreme Court. So with that, I believe, now I forgot, Ben, you're going first, am I right? I'm going first. I'm going first. Okay, sorry about that, go ahead. No problem. <clears throat> well, thank you everybody and thank you Justice for the introduction. It's a very timely topic. We have argument on these issues in the Wisconsin Supreme Court on Monday. And as I'm about to discuss, it's been an issue that's been kicking around for a while, both at the state and federal level. To situate the issue, I think we need to start with first principles. And for this, I'll take you back to high school civics there are three branches of government, both at the state level in Wisconsin and at the national level. There is an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. And traditionally, each of those branches has a very defined role, or what I'll call a lane, a lane in which they must uh, stay within the, the lines. So the, the role of the executive branch is to execute the laws, to carry out the laws, to enforce the laws. The role of the legislative branch is to make the laws and the role of the judicial branch is to interpret and apply the laws. There is no fourth branch of government under either constitution, but as we all know in the state and at the federal level, there is effectively a fourth branch. It is the administrative state. And the way the administrative state is understood in the federal context differs significantly and in important ways from the way it is understood to work and does work 
at the state level in Wisconsin. Agencies at the federal level are thought to be creatures more or less of the executive branch. Maybe not creatures, they're created by the Congress, but they are within the executive branch and they must, they must uh, forward executive branch policy making in order to be within their lanes. So to give a generic example, we're all familiar with OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health, Admi uh, Health Administration. Their role, according to law, is to issue regulations promoting the safety and health of workers at the workplace. Acting within that designated sphere, they are thought to be executive actors. They are enforcing the, the mission that has been given to them by the legislature. And if they stay within their lanes, they're acting as executive officials. But what happens if they act outside those lanes? What happens if they exceed those lanes? Well, in the federal context, courts say that to exceed those uh, lanes is to usurp the authority of the legislative branch. So once an executive official is doing something that looks a lot like lawmaking, courts get nervous because lawmaking is a power vested solely under Article I in the Congress. But what happens conversely if the Congress gives authority to OSHA or the EPA or some other agency that looks like authority that the legislature would be exercising in the first instance? So I think a law professor has come up with an example of a goodness and niceness statute, which tells the EPA or some other agency to just do whatever you think is good and nice. Well, that looks a lot like legislative authority because that's why we have a Congress. We have a Congress to pursue the common good um, and promote the general welfare as the constitution, the federal constitution says. And we expect them to take steps to promote those policies by making laws. But if the Congress instead hands over its power to the agency and says, OSHA or EPA, you do that thing. You do the thing we're supposed to do. Courts call that a non-delegation problem. It's an implied premise of the federal constitution and the state constitution that the three branches of government can't give away their powers. So the legislature can't perform the role of judges. The executive branch can't perform the role of the legislature. So such a delegation would theoretically be struck down by a court as exceeding the constitutional limitation on an agency understood as part of the executive branch in the federal system. Now, what's interesting is when there is a grant of authority to an agency and the agency acts pursuant to that grant of authority, it's given a wide degree of deference in the same way that a prosecutor is given a wide degree of deference when enforcing criminal laws. So we have criminal laws and we expect prosecutors, federal and state, to pursue them according to their policy interests by prioritizing certain enforcement um, strategies, by prioritizing certain kinds of crimes, and by choosing targets that are sensible targets given the priorities of the executive branch official. So we call that executive branch activity. We call that uh, carrying out or enforcing the laws. When it comes to agencies, it's the same idea. When the supposing Congress gives an agency specific enough directions, gives OSHA or the EPA specific enough directions, now when the agency's acting within the scope of that grant of authority, it's thought to be um, an executive branch activity and therefore, as the Supreme Court held in the famous Chevron case, which is the most cited case in the history of the United States, agencies have authority to interpret statutes that give them authority so long as their interpretations are reasonable. So they get to kind of gap fill the statutes as a part of their executive branch function. So just like a prosecutor gets to decide I'm bringing a case against this person because I think what he or she did is armed robbery. An agency gets to bring a case because they think what this uh, meatpacking plant did or what this grocery store did violates some standard of health and safety in the case of OSHA. 
But what's happened at the federal level and the state level is courts have begun to think that maybe the, the lanes set up for agencies and the lanes set up um, for commissions and, and, and all these other entities that operate within the fourth branch might be too broad. And so now there are questions about how, how should courts constrain, how should legislatures constrain the authority of agencies to ensure that they're not exercising kind of general legislative authority. So contrast the federal model where, again, the executive execute those, executes the laws and the agencies, to the extent they're constitutional, <clears throat> are carrying out an executive function by implementing policy making and sort of reading between the lines of statutes and sort of filling in the gaps the way that Congress would want them to. Contrast that with how the system works in Wisconsin. So in Wisconsin, it, it's the same rule at the, at the highest level. The legislature makes the laws, the governor executes the laws and the courts interpret and apply the laws. But Courts in Wisconsin emphasize that administrative agencies are creations of the legislature, as they say repeatedly, and they can exercise only those powers granted by the legislature. So far, federal courts and federal doctrine would agree as to federal agencies, but here's where it gets a little um, different. Therefore, Wisconsin courts conclude, administrative agencies in our state are actually a part of the legislative branch of government that created them. And because they're a part of that branch, they are subject to oversight by that branch. The court has even said that there has to be some form of oversight, otherwise there's an, a non-delegation problem. So the court said as recently as the Palm case, which I'll describe in a minute, we have allowed the legislature to delegate its authority to make law to administrative agencies. But as we've stated, such a delegation is allowed only if there are adequate standards for conducting the allocated power. Stated otherwise, a delegation of legislative power to a subordinate agency will be upheld if the purpose of the delegating statute is ascertainable and there are procedural safeguards to ensure that the border agency acts within that legislative purpose. Now, if that system, if Congress tried to implement that system for the federal administrative state, there's a very strong argument that it would be straight up unconstitutional. And this has to do with a case from the 80s called Chada, where the legislature, the Congress, did attempt to exercise oversight authority over the INS in that case. But the court said, no, 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 Congress, you have one role and one role only. That's to pass laws. And to pass laws, you have to satisfy the bicameralism and presentment clauses. You have to pass them in both houses and you have to subject them to a presidential signature or veto. You can't do anything short of those things um, to oversee an agency. So you can't have a committee that oversees the agency in the sense that it can countermand the agency's orders or rules. And you can't even as two houses countermand agency rules or decisions. You have to go through the president like you're passing a law. In Wisconsin, it's different as I'm about to describe we have a legislative apparatus starting with the Joint Committee for the Review of Administrative Rules and going all the way to both houses that allows the entity that created the agencies in the first place to oversee them sort of as subordinates. It's like the agencies are the legislature's subordinates rather than the subordinates of the governor. So moving on to Act 21. Act 21 passed in 2011 and uh, signed by then Governor Walker was an attempt to rein in, as, as the proponents would say, the excesses of the administrative state in Wisconsin. So everybody agreed until Act 21 that, let, that agencies can exercise only the powers that they're given. That, would, that much was common ground. But there came to be this doctrine developed in Wisconsin courts of implied powers. So there would be a statute giving DHS or DNR broad authority to, in the case of DNR, promote the, the safety of Wisconsin's natural resources and, resources and to conserve those resources. And what was happening was that courts were saying, these are pretty general powers and 
given that a lot can be thought to fit within the definition of protecting Wisconsin's resources, agencies have a lot of implied powers to do a number of specific things that no statutes expressly address. So that was the doctrine of implied power. Act 21 introduces a different presumption. So there are two important parts that we'll be discussing today. One is section 2M of what is now 227.10. And it says basically an agency can't implement or enforce a standard requirement, threshold, any kind of condition that is not itself explicitly required or explicitly, explicitly permitted by a different statute or rule. So implied powers are out the window. You have to point either to a statute or to a rule that allows you to impose any kind of requirement um, via, a, via a regulation or an adjudication. And by the way, agencies operate in these two different ways. There's rulemaking and adjudication. Rulemaking under an Administrative Procedure Act is a way that a, an agency more or less legislates. They put together a regulation, they adopt the regulation. If they jump through procedural hoops, the regulation becomes the law. Adjudication is like, is agencies acting as quasi-judicial actors. So an example in Wisconsin would be uh, DWD, uh, the Department of Workforce Development or LERC. An example in the federal system would be the NLRB. They make decisions in particular cases like a court would and, and in that way develop the law. The second part of Act 21 says that agencies not only can't use implied authority to impose specific requirements on parties, they also can't look to generic legislative purpose type provisions that are typically found in an agency's organic statute, the statute that creates the agency in the first place. You can't look to those broad grants of authority or what would otherwise seem to be broad grants of authority to infer rulemaking authority. The rulemaking authority has to be given specifically and it has to be given in those terms and probably in a statute other than a statutory provision other than a general purpose section. So those are the most important parts of Act 21. There are also other features of Act 21 that strengthen the legislative oversight process um, that in Wisconsin we're all uh, familiar with the, the idea that an emergency rule has to go through a joint committee of the legislature to get final approval. The idea that a, a non-emergency rule also has to go to a committee and often both houses to be approved, again, which is nothing like how it works in the federal system. But the first, the first case in which these provisions were teed up and the only case thus far was legislature versus Palm the case having to do with the authority of the Department of Health Services to issue a COVID lockdown order that was termed an order and not a rule and imposed a number of requirements. We're all familiar in Wisconsin with what those requirements were because we lived it um, on business activity, on travel, on any number of things. And there was a question in that case about whether the agency had to proceed by rulemaking rather than just post in, in order to its website and call that law. And the court ultimately held they had to proceed by rulemaking. But the more interesting question for our purposes today is the second question on which the court granted review, which is if DHS has general authority to protect the people of Wisconsin from a virus, from an outbreak, and it can do a number of general things in pursuit of that goal, does that mean it also has implied authority to do more or less whatever DHS thinks is necessary to promote that end? Or does it have to stick with the specific subsections of its statutes that allow it to say quarantine a sick person or close a particular school if there's an outbreak present at the school? Does it have a kind of roving commission and implied authority to do the things that aren't explicitly set forth in the statute? And the court said no, and the court cited Act 21. And what the court said is very interesting. It said basically Act 21 is a legislatively imposed canon of construction. So getting back to this idea of deference, Chevron deference in the federal system, um, there was an equivalent def uh, deference doctrine in Wisconsin for a number of years. They're saying, no, no, a Act 21 is a way to read statutes. So the explicit authority requirement is 
a canon of construction that requires us to narrowly construe imprecise delegations of power to administrative states. It's basically a rule um, against a broad interpretation to the extent that interpretation is, is based on um, what would be implied by the law. So the court said that in Palm, it didn't say much else other than it did say ultimately in a holding that what the Department of Health Services was attempting to do under its organic statute exceeded the explicit grants of authority in that statute. And therefore under Act 21, it went too far, but they didn't draw the particular lines that the agency crossed. So against that backdrop, we have the Clean Wisconsin and Kindred Farms cases, which I'll refer to generally as Clean Wisconsin. Those are the cases that will be argued on Monday. And the question in each of them is a little bit different. In Clean Wisconsin, the court is considering how DNR may regulate high capacity wells. And in the statutes, there are basically three kinds of high capacity wells. There are the really big ones, the medium sized ones, and the really small ones. And for the really big ones, the statutes impose a number of environmental conditions that can and should be imposed on the wells. For the, uh, for the small wells, there's, there's, there are no such conditions. In fact, it's, it's obvious from the statute that there should be no such conditions. It's the middle category that folks are litigating over. They're wondering, can DNR impose conditions on uh, high capacity wells in that middle category where there isn't an explicit um, authorization to do so in a statute. And so it tees up the Act 21 discussion um, perfectly, the, the Act 21 question that I posed earlier in my presentation. And I'll note that, you know, there's this temptation to think that Act 21 basically just puts the kibosh on administrative activity generally. To the extent you don't have a specific statute, you agency can act. But I would, I would remind folks who are who follow this area that it, that's not quite accurate even under an aggressive reading of the statute that's not true the explicit authority requirement looks not only to statutes but also to rules so i think it can be better understood as a public notice provision so if an agency adopts a rule if an agency has rulemaking authority and it adopts a rule allowing it to impose certain conditions on a regulated entity then so long as it is so long as those conditions are in the rule, they can impose them, even if they're not in the statute. So there are there are mechanisms by which agencies can um, continue to do what they did before Act 21. They just have to pass rules that are specific and that give people a heads up as to what conditions might be imposed on them. So that's Clean Wisconsin, and then Kinnard Farms. It's a little bit different, but it's the, the same idea. That case has to do whether do with whether DNR can impose certain conditions on large CAFOs or concentrated animal feeding operations, basically huge farms. Um, one condition is off-site groundwater monitoring. Can the DNR require you to monitor uh, whether you're discharging pollutants into uh, property outside beyond the farm? And then another is can they regulate the number of dairy cows? Uh, there aren't explicit grants of authority on those two questions, but they're sort of things that DNR has historically done. And so uh, that's the question posed in Kindred Farms. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, and I'm happy to answer any questions from the moderator or from anybody else, but um, I'll bounce it over to my colleague and then I'll, I'll circle back if there's anything else. Great, great presentation, Ryan. Thank you. All right, we'll go to Ben and then we'll open it up for questions and I have some questions too. Ben? Yeah, uh, Ryan kind of left us with the perfect segue here. Um, the question then being, when can uh, administrative agencies um, rule make or, or, or promulgate new administrative uh, rules? Um, and there's two um, interesting attorney general opinions uh, on this matter, um, as many of you are probably familiar, um, admit, uh, attorney general opinions, while are not exactly law, um, do carry um, some persuasive authority in, in the courts uh, and, and are often given some deference, especially on issues that haven't been decided um, by Wisconsin's courts. Um, so the two opinions that I'm talking about are uh, 
called the Sprinkler Opinions. Um, they had to do with Department of Safety and Professional Services rules involving uh, fire uh, automatic sprinkler requirements for multiple dwelling units. Um, so apartment buildings, uh, for example. Um, so the first of these sprinkler opinions was issued by um, Attorney General Schimmel in uh, 2017. Um, and going off of uh, Ryan's description of what, what Act 21 did, um, the Attorney General started um, by basically stating that agencies do not possess any inherent or applied authority to promulgate rules or enforce standards. Um, that's kind of the crux of what Act 21 did. And the Attorney General's opinion was that uh, those legislative intent, general purpose findings or, or policy statements um, in the origination statute for agencies um, don't confer or augment agency rulemaking authority. Basically, agency, you need a specific um, grant under a, a specific requirement to further make rules uh, interpreting and applying that, that statutory grant of authority. Um, so basically, if the statutes don't contain the specific standard requirement or threshold, um, then the agency can't act. Uh, after determining that, in this case, that the DSPS sprinkler rule and the state statute both required a requirement covering the same conduct, so in this case, the state statute required uh, dwelling buildings with dwelling units of 20 or more, or, or over 20, I believe, to have these automated sprinklers. DSPS implemented a rule saying it's actually more than four buildings with more than four units, so quite a dis discrepancy there. Uh, the Attorney General's opinion found the, that uh, the DSPS couldn't go further than that, that 20. They couldn't be more restrictive. Uh, so by way of example, uh, you know, under, under the two con competing uh, standards, a builder of a five unit multifamily dwelling uh, under the statute would not be required to install a sprinkler system, but under the rule would be required to. So what do I have to comply with if I'm the builder? Um, the opinion also concluded that while DSPS did possess uh, general power to adopt uh, reasonable and proper rules and regulations relative to the exercise of its powers and authorities. So again, one of those general broad grants of authority. Uh, according to the Attorney General, the language is really describing the agency's general powers and duties, but didn't require uh, confer uh, specific rulemaking authority. Uh, and then just this last October in 2020, uh, Attorney General Call uh, issued an opinion which withdrew the Schimmel opinion. Uh, in this new opinion, uh, the Attorney General provided that Act 21 does not alter explicit grants of rulemaking authority, regardless of whether the rulemaking provision which the authorities granted could be characterized as broad or general. So kind of the exact opposite interpretation. Uh, so in this case, DSPS, you have this broad grant of rulemaking authority, uh, even though this other statute says uh, buildings of with uh, 20 or more dwelling units uh, you can, because you have this broad grant of authority also, it has to be read in conjunction with, with each other. Uh, and you may be more restrictive than that uh, statutory standard because of this other broad grant. Uh, again, so the, the call opinion emphasized that while an agency must stay within the boundaries of what the legislature has provided, uh, this doesn't require uh, that exact words used in an administrative rule appear in statutes. Basically, you have to have the authorizing uh, language saying that you can make a rule, but it, it doesn't have to, your rule doesn't have to be limited to exactly what's provided in statute. Um, so ultimately, this means if the legislature explicitly confers rulemaking authority in a statute, such as by stating that it ag agencies shall adopt reasonable and proper rules and regulations, Act 21 did not in fact alter that authority. Um, so basically the call opinion concluded that while agencies must administer specific standards set by the legislature, in this case, DSPS has to uh, enforce the sprinkler, sprinkler rule on uh, dwell, uh, buildings with 20 or more dwelling units, um, they still may adopt stricter standards based on this broad grant of rulemaking authority. Um, in, in, in essence, 
saying the legislature established a statutory floor um, to ensure minimum safety standards. Um, but because of this other grant of authority, TSPS, you may go um, uh, more restrictive than that. Um, so, you know, leaving some uh, conflicting interpretations, obviously the, obviously the Schimmel opinion has been withdrawn, but it's kind of a, a reverse direction and, and some confusion for the industries that are regulated by these rules. Um, you know, these, the clean Wisconsin cases might provide some additional guidance on that. Um, and then next I'm going to uh, talk about kind of some of the broader implications of Act 21 and, and what a narrow uh, interpretation of uh, agency implied powers by the court in the clean Wisconsin cases could mean. Um, and again, this is going to be based, the legal fallouts from, from what this could mean, you know, whether it's good or bad policy is another question, but just kind of what could come from this, um, particularly as it relates to state agency authority in actions and also um, some of the downstream effects on that on uh, local governments. Um, and I'll get into that in a second here. So from a very high level perspective, uh, let's say, the clean Wisconsin cases say uh, kind of go with the uh, attorney Schimmel perspective or sorry, attorney general Schimmel perspective um, of, of very much restricted state agency authority under Act 21. Um, so in general, we, you know, this case has to do with DNR, has to do with high capacity wells and CAFOs, but, you know, there could be room for a broad application of that if DNR doesn't have this authority from these general grants of authority uh, and it's authorizing statutes, then, you know, arguably that should be applied to other state agencies as well. Um, that, it, you know, DSPS in the Sprinkler case or, you know, DOT often has uh, broad grants of authority to regulate in cer certain areas. So all state agencies could find themselves more open to potential uh, claims or challenges to their authority in these areas, if, you know, depending on a, uh, a favorable um, decision in the clean Wisconsin cases to, um, you know, favorable to the Act 21 standards. So what will happen with state agencies from this? Um, you know, some might continue to take that risk and continue operating business as usual, um, and they may face uh, more litigation um, if, you know, some industries feel emboldened by the uh, Clean Wisconsin decision, depending on what that is. Um, some may choose not to take that risk and might impose less conditions on permits and licenses uh, or generally regulate less um, than they have previously or traditionally. Um, or some might, um, you know, might be some of each of these. Um, a, a third option is they might promulgate more administrative rules. Um, as we just discussed, when can they do this is, is a question that's somewhat open and, and at issue still. Um, but generally, I think you're going to see more administrative rulemaking uh, after the Clean Wisconsin case. Um, but on the flip side, you know, again, they need to have this uh, explicit statutory authority to make those rules. Um, it's a time-consuming process. It's a cumbersome process. Having been through it, it takes time. There's a lot of steps. Uh, and it doesn't allow for necessarily a ton of flexibility or to, to make changes quickly. Uh, going beyond, as I mentioned, the state agency impact, you know, there are indirect downstream effects of this on local governments as well that might not be so obvious at, at first glance. Um, so Act 21 and Chapter 227, which is uh, what Act 21 modified, adding, adding the explicit authority requirements, uh, again, only directly apply to state agency regulatory authority and rulemaking authority that Chapter 227 does not affect directly counties, cities, villages, towns, um, but counties, cities, villages, and towns regulatory authority is often affected by the extent of state agency regulatory authority because uh, there's many cases uh, in instances where local governments have concurrent or complementary jurisdiction to state agencies. Uh, so a very straightforward example of this is when local governments have authority to regulate in a manner that uh, is not more restrictive than state agencies. Um, so if a state agency's authority is 
more res restricted than was previously imp implemented because of Act 21. Uh, there is a very good argument that the local government authority is also more restricted um, because again, under statute, they're not allowed to regulate in a, ma um, in a manner more restrictive than what the, what the state does. Uh, so a couple examples of this, uh, you know, chapter two, uh, 281 is at issue in the clean Wisconsin cases. That's has to do with the, uh, you know, water and sewage regulation. So high capacity wells, there's a lot of instances in that chapter where, um, municipalities, counties cannot regulate in a manner more restrictive than DNR. If DNR's, um, authority is more restricted then arguably so too is, uh, county and municipality authority. Another example is when uh, energy siting applications and approvals, local governments have uh, authority under uh, section 660401 of the statutes to approve, uh, so windmills, wind energy siting, uh, if they choose to regulate in that area. But again, in, in that instance, they may not regulate in a manner more restrictive than the standards established by uh, the PSC. So again, if the PSC arguably uh, can't established standards uh, or, or the, the standards established by it are more restricted than previous, then so too would the, the local um, standards. So conditions on approval, that sort of thing, and reasons for denial of applications would be restricted uh, and more limited than they were before. Uh, another issue faced by uh, the local governments is the regulatory gap that might come um, with a strict interpretation of Act 21. Um, you know, you could have instances where state agencies are no longer regulating uh, in an area to the extent they did previously. So you're going to have some things that maybe they did regulate before that aren't regulated now, um, or at least not regulate to the extent that they were before. Um, so in this case, you, you might have some local governments who want to pick up the slack, fill in that, that gap that's been created by um, the reduced regulation by state agencies. Um, but in this case, that's not always possible or not advisable um, because there's there are significant preemption issues that come along with this. Um, in many cases, state agencies are granted regulatory, regulatory authority over ma matters which local governments aren't or the local government authority they do have doesn't go that far. Um, so even though municipalities uh, and to a lesser extent counties have some home rule authority under the for municipalities under the con uh, state constitution, counties statutory, um, it's still likely that they could be preempted from regulating a lot of these cases. Um, you know, where the state is regulating, it's unlikely that the locals could go go further than that. Uh, so, as an example, it's let's say DOT is regulating uh, motor vehicle safety features that are required, um, and let's say local government says, "Well, they're not." requiring enough. We want to require more. Um, it's probable that the local government would be preempted from doing that because the state has already taken over um, that field. Um, again, it's not quite so cut and dry. There's an analysis would need, need to be performed in all these cases. Uh, there's standards set, uh, that have been established by the Wisconsin Supreme Court um, discussing when regulations are preempted. Uh, I won't get into detail on those, but, you know, for example, when local regulation conflicts with state legislation, ar arguably, if you're going um, further than what the state is requiring, you could find some conflict there. Um, a, a good uh, recitation of those standards can be found in actually one of the Lake Beulah cases, the, uh, again, first the Village of East Troy, not the DNR one. Uh, so another, a real world example of how this plays out, um, Ryan already discussed the uh, Wisconsin Legislature v. Palm case, and it's how it applied the concepts of Act 21. Um, again, in that case, uh, the Supreme Court determined that Secretary Palm did not have the explicit statutory authority to issue these orders, and that it was a rule um, and, and should have undergone the rulemaking process under Chapter 227, among other issues that, th that they found with it. Um, so the effect of this was twofold. The, the follow-up kind of fills in those concepts I just, or, or examples of those concepts I just talked about. So DHS basically chose the option that, uh, option two that I mentioned at the beginning, that they're mostly not gonna implement and enforce uh, 
in, or have enforceable public health measures like the safer at home order. So what happened then? Well, in this case, you had local governments, and in this case, local health officers mostly who have some concurrent regulatory authority with DHS over uh, communicable disease outbreaks. Uh, so then you, you were left with each local health officer and in, in their jurisdiction, mostly by county, but also some individual cities scrambling to uh, figure out, well, what can we do in light of this? What should we do? Um, and there was a lot of confusion. They didn't know what they should do or how far they could go. So there were a lot of different, uh, a patchwork of different rules and regulations throughout the state. Um, some that were uh, simply guidance, some that were as or more restrictive than the DHS rules uh, and orders. So you were left with confusion there and it created confusion among Wisconsin residents about which rules were actually required uh, in, in their jurisdiction or what, what applied or, or if they went, you know, to from Ozaki County to Milwaukee County, well, what do I have to do now? Um, so again, the fallout is a lot of uh, confusion and uh, scrambling by local governments to figure out what to do next. And we're seeing this now again with uh, the governor's mask mandate uh, no longer being in effect. There's some local communities that are implementing their own, some that aren't, aren't doing that at all and, and figuring out whether they can do that. Um, so whether any of this is uh, good or bad policy that should be left to local governments is another question, but um, as we've seen from the real, real world COVID examples is when there's a vacuum suddenly left by uh, lesser state authority, uh, there's, there's problems and, and confusions to react to that from, from local governments. So with that, I think uh, we're open to questions for another 15 minutes or so. I don't know if Ryan has any supplemental, uh, supplemental points he wants to interject with, but well, let me ask a couple of questions. There are a couple of questions on the board and then Ryan, if you want to jump in. Um, you know, one of the questions um, I have is that <clears throat> I think that a lot of these administrative um, rules disputes have really come into the forefront as we've become a much more partisan country um, with parties divided, you know, the collaboration that Marjorie talked about doesn't happen as much as we would like it to. And, um, we find, you know, the mask mandate clearly is one of those issues, not only in Wisconsin, but lots of states about who has the authority um, and does it fall under regulation, not regulation. Our court has struggled with how much deference to give to particular um, administrative actions. I remember when I was on the court a long time ago, generally the rule was to give a lot of deference to the, to the agency. And now not, it depends. And, and there certainly are justices on the court that think that strong deference should not be given. Um, whether it's citing of windmills or whether it's um, the DNR, there's a lot of controversy about those agencies, who's heading them up and how they're done. How do you think that that has impacted sort of the development of the law in the field and um, where it may sort of tell us where it's going? Ryan, yeah. if you want to start. Yeah, that's a fascinating topic. Going all the way back to the beginning, um, you know, the administrative state really got up and running in the early part, of, early part of the 20th century. It became ensconced in the federal government during the New Deal when there was a Democratic president who oversaw the agencies and for a while a Republican controlled legislature so there was partisan tension immediately. And a lot of the early administrative law cases in, in the federal government go back to those days. But then even as recently as the 1970s and 80s, when President Carter used the agencies to pursue a very aggressive administrative agenda. Um, and then Reagan is sworn in and his policy becomes, well, we ought to deregulate. So it was less about administrative accountability. It was more a policy in favor of just fewer rules, just fewer regulations governing industry. And it was the Reagan folks in the Reagan White House and the Office of Legal Counsel who were the early defenders of Chevron deference. The idea again, that agencies should get latitude to read these statutes 
however they think they should be read so long as they're acting reasonably and courts should stay out of it and courts shouldn't strike down these statutes as giving overbroad authority to agencies. So it was it was the Reagan folks and most prominently my former boss, Justice Scalia, who were the defenders of Chevron deference and the defenders of administrative state flexibility. They said, look, this is these are executive branch determinations. The executive branch gets to determine what the policies are of um, the, the law enforcers, the agencies themselves. And, you know, we, we can't have courts interfering with this because if courts pick an interpretation of a statute, it gets locked in, but an agency can, um, you know, go back and forth depending on who's in charge. Uh, and that was thought to be a good thing. And then I suppose in the late 90s, early 2000s, there became this more organized movement on the conservative side of the of the um, legal sphere in favor of just broad uh, regulatory reform and particularly procedural reform on how the administrative state acts, you know, what procedures should the agencies be subject to, um, you know, and then at, at a certain point it became questioning Chevron itself. So I think, you know, there's a lot from the Gorsuch and Kavanaugh confirmation hearings that we remember, but one thing that we tend to forget is that those two in particular were known in the federal courts of appeals as being prominent crit uh, critics of the Chevron regime and of the administrative state generally, also fans of the non-delegation doctrine. There's a lot of talk about reinvigorating the non-delegation doctrine and just saying, you know, certain grants of authorities to agencies are just go too far. And I think the debate in Wisconsin has largely mirrored that pattern. Uh, Act 21 was a by and large partisan bill. Um, but then, you know, at the end of the day, Justice, it all depends on who controls the government, right? Who has the levers of authority? You know, during the Trump administration, there were, there were a number of occasions where the White House used uh, the administrative state in an, in an aggressive manner to issue executive orders, to do controversial things, at the same time pursuing administrative reform with Congress. Uh, in the Obama administration, there are examples of the president using his pen and his phone, as he famously said, to accomplish objectives that he couldn't get through Congress. Um, but then, you know, a lot of the same defenders of President Obama became critics of President Trump. And it sort of all just reverses itself depending on who controls the executive branch. The one constant theme, though, is that the legislative branches seem to be completely okay with agencies doing the job of the legislature. So whether it's Republicans or Democrats, there, there are moderate reforms here and there on what agencies can do. But I mean, by and large, the open secret is that there are things that agencies do that the legislatures don't want to have to do because they don't want to have to own it and because it's highly technical, highly specialized. I think everybody would agree at the end of the day that there needs to be some kind of administrative apparatus. We've had one going back to the 18th century. Um, and it's just a question of what, what Congress in the federal example or what the Wisconsin legislature in our case really wants to reclaim ownership of. And I think that you know, in the political sphere, that's going to depend a lot on who's in power and what do we want to do? Ben, I'm going to move to one of the questions from one of our, our viewers. Um, Leonard Justin asks, what is the rulemaking process like at the agency level? Taking the DHS example, would it have been possible for DHS to quickly pass the rules required to allow for COVID restrictions? Or is this a pretty long, difficult process? Uh, Yes and no. Uh, it's there is authority to do emergency rulemaking, uh, which is a quicker process. But again, there's legislative oversight and and ability there for the uh, committee to uh, kind of negate that rule to an extent. So who knows what would have happened with that process? Um, and again, the emergency rules only are in force for not, not remembering exactly. I think six months, um, and they can be extended a couple of times, but they, that also requires uh, committee approval for that extension. So again, yes and no, there, there is a process 
process to do that. It probably wouldn't have ended up looking exactly like DHS wanted it to, um, which is maybe why we didn't see that happen. Um, and again, long term, it was there's question marks there. If you're making permanent rules, the process is quite long. Uh, I've been in, involved in the process myself. I'd say a quick rulemaking process takes a year, and that's moving moving pretty fast um, for a permanent rule. So there, there's hearings along the way. There's you, you kick it off with a statement of scope, and there there's pub, public comments and committee hearings, and it, it takes some time. Thank you. Cindy Carter asks, this country is being run by Alex. How do they fit into all of this? Obviously the first part of the question is a political statement, but, but how does Alex fit into all the rulemaking and some of the controversy over the rulemaking? Either one of you can take that if you want. Sorry, Alex, is that Alec? The... Alec, Alec, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have much of a comment there. I don't follow Alec closely, um, but I think I mean I think the question is ultimately ultimately one of does partisanship drive this conversation? And I think yeah, in the short term it necessarily does on both sides. Um, you, again, you just have to contrast um, the Trump administration and the Obama administration. In 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 one case many folks were defenders of executive aggressive unilateral executive action in the other case they weren't it just depends on who's who's in charge but it's true that generally uh the business community supports stricter controls on it on the administrative process i think they wouldn't want it to go away entirely i'm speculating but i think generally businesses like at the end of the day predictability they're not going to agree with every rule. Um, and they recognize that the agencies have extensive authority over what they can and can't do. Um, and Act 21 gives them or is designed to give them that predictability because it says, agency, if you can't do something specifically in, a, in an adjudication against us, then you can't do it at all. But if you have a rule that says you can do it, you can do it later. So if you give us a heads up that you know, you have rulemaking authority, you're using that rulemaking authority to impose a condition. You can later impose that condition on us and not have an Act 21 problem. Um, so I think the, I think that's probably why the business community gen generally has been in favor of administrative reforms like Act 21. Ben, do you have anything to add to that? No, nothing to add on that. Um, Travis Gresham says, thank you both for the presentation. Since this act was passed after an election, is there any implication that the executive approval of the legislative clawback was in bad faith, essentially stripping power from an office prior to departure? Hmm. I think that's a reference to the, the lame duck bills, which did make adjustments to the administrative Review Act, Chapter 227, but those are separate from Act 21. And yes, there are all kinds of arguments about whether those laws were good or bad or in good faith or bad faith. And I think those questions are still being litigated in the Wisconsin courts. There's one more question about on this issue. The Wisconsin legislature did not meet for 10 months during COVID. Was this a large part of the problem with handling the pandemic in Wisconsin since the state did not have consistent health regulations? Yeah, I think this gets to the question asked earlier that, that Ben answered about, do we have a procedure in the state for quick acting, um, right. you know, sort of fast acting responses to emergencies and the executive branch classically is thought to be the, the entity that's supposed to react quickly. It's supposed to be positioned to act fast in response to quickly emerging situations. So in Wisconsin, we have the, the emergency statute, which gives the governor a very broad um, set of authorities for a certain time, and then they expire unless the legislature extends them. And then there's also at the same time, this emergency rulemaking power, which Ben described, and he's right to say it was a big issue in Palm. I was involved in the Palm case and argued argued it. And I went back and forth with Justice Ann Walsh Bradley about just how quickly could this rule 
have been implemented under the emergency rulemaking procedures? And that's a big question. Um, and I think, you know, our position was, and I, th I still think it's correct, that the the um, order and issue, the stay at, home, stay at home order issue, could have been put together in plenty of time during the initial 60 days when the governor has very, very broad authority to do a number of things. So that was our position in that case. And I think as a structural matter, that's how it's designed. So yes, to, to, to answer the question a little more directly, our system is an emergency hits, the governor has at least 60 days to address it. Um, the agencies have that much time to put together any emergency rules that they think should be put in place. That does require that the legislature in the form of the joint committee get a seat at the table, which does involve, you know, there's, there's, now, a, there's now a partisan, in, our, in Wisconsin's case, there's a bipartisan element to it. Both sides have to sit down and work, work it out together. Um, but, you know, depending on how those dynamics are playing out at any given time, you could see in the case of the governor not playing ball with the legislature. You could also see in the case of the legislature not playing ball with the governor. It, it, it descends into politics. Um, and that is, for better or worse, our system. At the end of the day, it's elected officials making decisions based on what they think the popular will supports. And uh, so it becomes inevitably political. And to follow up on that, you did see, um, you know, with the governor's original emergency order, there was a safer home order itself, and there were a number of uh, additional orders relaxing certain administrative rules for, let's say, childcare requirements or licensing requirements. Um, and those were actually then converted into emergency rule um, and carried out through much of the, the pandemic. So we did see that with just the lesser known and paid attention, uh, things that weren't paid as much attention to. So that did happen. Right. Great. Thank you both for an excellent presentation. It was very good. And um, there's going to be an announcement with the CLE passcode um, at this point. I think it's going to be posted. So you need that to, to, for as a passcode to show that you attended CLE. I want to thank the panelists again for participating and all of you for having been part of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Justice. Uh, thank you, Ryan and Ben. We appreciate you joining us today. Um, it was a very interesting discussion and, and I think all the audience I'm sure appreciated um, the range of questions you took, not just about Act 21, but about uh, this topic more generally. I also wanna thank Delaney Brewer. She was unable to be with us today um, due to an issue that came up uh, that, that required her attention, um, but she intended on being here and I appreciate her uh, committing to that early on months ago. So thanks again. And I'll turn it over to Ryan. Great. Well, thanks, Eric. And thanks to everybody again. I thought this was an outstanding uh, job, uh, wonderfully informative. And I, I really thank everybody for, for doing this, for being part of it. It's the kind of stuff that we're proud to do here at the, at the Thompson Center. So um, we are uh, going to, uh, to shift gears now. We are going to hear from uh, Congressman Tom Tiffany uh, about Act 21. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Congressman Tom Tiffany uh, represents the 7th Congressional District of Wisconsin in uh, northern and western Wisconsin. Uh, prior to his election to federal office in May of 2020, he served in Wisconsin State Assembly and in the State Senate uh, for the 12th District. He was a member of the state's Joint Finance Committee and served as chairman of the Senate Committee on Sporting, Heritage, Mining, and Forestry. He grew up on a dairy farm near Elmwood, Wisconsin, he graduated from the University of Wisconsin River Falls with a degree in agricultural economics. Congressman Tiffany served in the state legislature during deliberations and passage of 2011 Wisconsin Act 21. Uh, we're pleased to welcome him today to learn more about his role in the passage of that Act, Act 21, and the issue of legislative oversight uh, of the executive branch more broadly, and any thoughts he may have, uh, of course, in the ongoing case of Clean Wisconsin, which we all heard about uh, just a moment ago. So uh, thank you, Congressman, uh, Congressman Tiffany, for being here and to talk about uh, Act 21 and your role in it. Uh, I am proud now to uh, hand this over to, uh, to you and Eric to engage in the dialogue about this. Okay, Ryan, can you, Eric, can you hear me? 
I can, and your screen is not on at the moment. So uh, it says the host has to start my video. I started my video. If you, let me try again here, Eric. Here. How's that? Very good. Good. So, Eric, would you like me just to start in, or what would you like to do? Sure, we can either handle this as a, as a conversation, or if you'd like to make some initial remarks, then we can proceed into the questions. Yeah, that would be terrific. How about if I take about five minutes here, and then we'll go into it. I was just able to catch the last 10 to 15 minutes of the discussion, and uh, um, I think about those academic discussions, and we certainly had those um, back in 2011, and, um, but they really are important, and it was interesting uh, hearing the comments that were being shared by everyone. First of all, I apologize for being informal. I am down in the southern border, and we've been doing tours on the Rio Grande Valley here the last couple of days, and um, uh, it is literally and figuratively hot down here on the Rio Grande Valley with what's happening down in the McAllen, Texas area. But anyhow, I'm really glad to join all of you. Thanks to the Thompson Center for putting this on, and I want to thank Ryan Owens for the invitation uh, to do this today. It was really appreciated. Brought back some great memories of 10 years ago uh, with Act 21. So the genesis of Act 21 for me was primarily as a small business owner and as someone who was really involved in my community, especially with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, frequently communicating with my neighbors. And I would occasionally hear from people, and it was my experience, that I would see that uh, people would say, there's a law that is stopping me from doing this, or there's a law that is requiring me to do that. And it's before I knew the difference between a statute and an administrative rule. Well, as I began to dig into these a little bit more as the years went by and I became more politically active, I would go to my legislators and I would say, why did you pass that law? And they would say, we did not pass that law. That's an administrative rule. And we did not vote on that. Like, okay, uh, what shall I do? Well, you should go talk to the executive branch. So I would go talk to one of the governor's people or someone in the executive agency. And I'd ask, uh, in particular, the governor's office asked, you know, why was this passed? Well, this was done by the executive agency. They took this action. And I would ask, why didn't you stop it? Well, because we, uh, the agency has that authority. And so as time went by, and the best example that I can list that I thought admin where we needed administrative rule reform was in regards to shoreland zoning. You think about the area where I live up in Manaqua and Vilas and Oneida counties with um, all kinds of lakes up there. And shoreland zoning was always a very hot issue. And the changes were always made via administrative rule. And I think there was a fair amount of frustration on both sides, whether you wanted more stringent regulations or you wanted less stringent regulations. And uh, so once I was elected to Congress in 2010, I was thinking about this and in fact, I made it part of my campaign in 2010. So when Act 21 was introduced as a special session bill by Governor Walker, um, I took a look at it and I said, this appears to be what I want to do. One of the things that I think is really important for us to reform, because ultimately what I believe Act 21 is all about is transparency and accountability. This constant pointing fingers at each other prior to 2011, when legislators would say, no, that's the executive branch that created that. And the executive branch would say, well, go talk to your legislator. They can change the law if they want to. In the meantime, you had unelected officials that were basically creating laws, what I believe sometime was out of whole cloth, that had incredible impacts on the people of the state of Wisconsin, which is part of the reason we put the uh, economic impact analysis in there. So anyhow, um, I ended up being the only person in the legislature that signed on to this special session bill that Governor Walker introduced. And obviously 2011, everyone will remember Act 10, that was the most prominent piece of legislation. But there was a lot of other transformative legislation that went through there. Uh, or through that session in 2011 and 2012, you know, including things like uh, we be uh, uh, 
second amendment bill to allow concealed carry. We were the 49th state out of 50 to adopt that. Um, photo ID was passed uh, to vote in that session. So there's really this transformative time that was going on in the legislature and with the governor in 2011 and 2012. But I really thought Act 21 was the, one of the most important pieces of legislation that we passed. We were able to um, get it passed. And you know, I just made a list here of a couple of things that I thought were most important. I thought it was most important that, um, uh, that the agencies could not exceed what was in statute. That was always a frustration of mine. I think also having the governor approve the scope statement as well as the final rule, having that accountability from the governor, I thought was really important. The economic analysis, quite important. I don't know if that's been used entirely appropriately um, over the last few years or it's been used enough, but it isn't just the business community. I put that in there as much for local um, units of government. When you think about unfunded mandates, I heard that complaint all the time from local, uh, uh, local units of government. I was hoping by putting this, uh, the economic analysis in there that for significant rules that cost a lot of money, especially for local units of government, that we would trim some of that back. And the final thing was the judicial review. And while that wasn't the most prominent part of the bill, I think it was really important that judicial review not be held solely in Dane County. I believe it was important for local judges, local juries to hear these cases that are happening in communities that are a long way from Dane County. So I thought the judicial review part of it um, in regards to venue was very important also. So at the end of the day, I just thought this bill was about transparency, about accountability, and especially accountability on the part of the governor and on the part of us legislators. We are the elected officials that serve here in the state of Wisconsin. It is not that person who's working in the agency. They should not be writing the laws. In fact, one of the things that I saw when I initially came into the legislature, it was very common to put those few couple words that says, subject to rulemaking authority by the agency. In almost all of the bills that I authored in the nine plus years that I was in the legislature, I tried to keep those words out of my bills. And I thought it was important that us legislators be more specific about what we expect in our bills and what we want to accomplish with them rather than just leaving it to the rulemaking authority of the agencies, because oftentimes we saw that rulemaking authority did not match up with the legislative intent. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions anyone has, and uh, it's just great to be with everybody here today. Thank you, Congressman Tiffany. Um, while we're uh, transitioning here, I'd like to have Tia put up the last code, if we could, for CLE credits. And those who are participating for CLEs can enter that in um, into the Google form that Tia has provided in the, in the chat. And then submit it with their name. Thank you. Excellent. So Congressman Tiffany, um, you know, we started, uh, this is sort of an unrelated question, but it was something that we promised to, uh, to raise with you. And um, a couple months ago, when we started uh, promoting this event, um, we got a question about the certification of the election, which is an unrelated issue um, to what we're dealing with today, which is a state level discussion. But um, could you address, uh, there are some concerns about your uh, vote in that certification process in your position. Can you address that for the audience members that might be participating that wanted you to speak to that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So after November 3rd, uh, I thought we were, saw anomalies and irregularities in the election. And I think as most people know, the state Supreme Court did not take the case up um, um, because of standing. They did not take it on the merits of the case and they allowed it to go forward. And um, uh, and it's part of the reason, as I, I'll walk people through the timeline, when we got to the middle of December and the Texas case was filed, there were over 100 of us in Congress that signed on as amicus to the, um, uh, to the Texas case 
which basically said to the Supreme Court, this is an equal protection case. There's some states that had irregularities, anomalies, and those need to be reviewed to make sure that our vote is not diluted here in the state of Texas. And I signed on to that because I wanted to make sure that I believe the United States Supreme Court, and I still believe the United States Supreme Court should take up some of these cases and rule on them. I won't get into the specifics of the cases, but I thought they should be done. The US Supreme Court turned that down. So as I reviewed my constitutional authority, I saw my last authority as being on January 6th to object to the electors. And I did choose to uh, object to the electors of six states. Now, obviously the riots happened in the Capitol, disrupted that whole thing. Only Pennsylvania and Arizona uh, were contested. And, um, um, but, the thing that I hear from some people is they say, why did you try to overturn the election? That was not my goal after November 3rd. My goal was to investigate those improprieties and irregularities. And I believe that still needs to happen because um, Joe Biden may very well have won Wisconsin. In fact, probably won Wisconsin. But there's always going to be that cloud as a result of things that happen, like Take a look at the reporting we're getting out of Green Bay now. There was a Democrat operative hired by the mayor of Green Bay who had the keys to the central count in Green Bay. That was just revealed a few weeks ago. That kind of thing shouldn't be happening either for whether you're on the right or on the left, whether you're a conservative or a liberal, that should not be happening. So you had a Zuckerberg funded group that sent over a million dollars to Green Bay that um, they hired someone who was a longtime Democrat operative out in New York City. And that kind of thing needs to be reined in. Also, if you look at the last few weeks in both Virginia and Michigan, there have been court cases that have come down in their state courts where they've said um, to election officials, you need to follow the law in the future. You did not do this appropriately in 2020. And I just think it's really important for the courts to take up these cases sort them out and let's make sure that we don't have or limit these irregularities as much as possible because it really did um, cause, um, cause some doubt about this election. Thank you, Congressman. We, we promised to have that question asked uh, to someone that reached out to us. And so I wanted to do that uh, to honor their request for that to be addressed. But, and I appreciate you, you uh, being willing to do so. Um, you know, Steering back to the to the question of, of Act 21 and the Clean Wisconsin cases, um, you know, there are a number of questions I think that people might have who remember this. And, and I'll kind of try to draw back some of the details of the legislation back when it was under deliberation, just to get some feedback from you on your recollections of it and how it might be impacting things moving forward with the law and the, and the litigation. Um, you know, you addressed the, the origins and development of the law uh, you also just mentioned, I think, earlier that you were the only lawmaker that signed on with the governor on this legislation, um, and you, you shared a little bit about why, but can you, is that uncommon for, for those in the public that are watching for only one member to join on and then have it pass ultimately? Um, yeah, I mean, usually you get more people on. Um, sometimes with it being a special session bill, which is a request by the governor, um, you know, people view it as the governor's ask and sometimes they won't sign on. But um, I just thought it was so important to um, have someone who will champion this. And that's why I signed on to it um, and help shepherd it through the process. I just thought that this was, you know, you look at, we are so focused on tax and regulatory policy. And it is really sexy to have tax cuts and things like that. Regulatory reform is not that way. You don't get headlines in the paper. You don't get your picture in the paper or in social media, um, oftentimes for regulatory reform type things. But it's just as important. If you told me that we're going to reform the regulatory state and make it more streamlined, make it work for the public here in Wisconsin and across America, and we're gonna leave the tax structure alone, I would probably take that. I'll always take a tax cut, but I just think that the regulatory state, both state and nationally, has become so burdensome and it's become largely effective. I mean, we're seeing some things at the federal level now um, 
uh, with some of the regulatory processes where it's taking 15 to 20 years to get a permit. And that regulatory state is extremely costly and we need good regulations, but they need to be done appropriately. Thank you. So prior to Act 21, um, which of course was passed 10 years ago, um, according to uh, one account back then, only five agencies, DATCAP, Commerce, DNR, Transportation, and Workforce Development were required to do ec economic impact analyses. However, it was only upon petition of an affected group or groups. Um, so it was required, but with the caveat that someone had to petition for it to be done. Um, interestingly enough, the, the account back then says that there were no, no petitions. Uh, over the course of 152 pending administrative rules that year that were filed, um, zero. Um, under those circumstances, uh, why did you move forward with the bill um, if no one had petitioned in the prior year? I think I'd give you an example of why. If you remember in the final days of the Doyle administration in the summer of 2010, there was a phosphorus rule that was passed by the Department of Natural Resources. Um, that did not go through the legislative process. Uh, Governor Doyle did not actively go out and say to the legislature, would you pass this or put forward a special session bill? But that, uh, that administrative rule had the potential to have an impact of billions of dollars, not just millions, hundreds of millions. It had the potential impact of billions of dollars. And that simply went through the administrative rule process without any vote by the legislature. And I thought that was a great example of why we needed this administrative rule reform. And by the way, the postscript to that phosphorus rule being passed, which was more onerous than all of the states that surround us, we kept having to pass fixes in the subsequent Congresses for a number of years in order to mitigate what was happening as a result of that phosphorus administrative rule. We all want to remove phosphorus from um, our waterways, but I didn't believe that it was done in the appropriate fashion. It really should have went through the legislature and had a full vote. Thank you for that explanation. The, you know, the next question, and, and you know, whenever the Thompson Center puts on events, they're for educational purposes, but in, in, inevitably people line up on different sides of an issue. And, and our hope is to bring people together to talk about those different sides of the issues and get a objective vetting of that issue for educational purposes. Um, we don't take a position on them per se. But um, in this particular instance with Act 21, 10 years ago, if you go back into the Wisconsin lobbying reports at the time, um, something that's common, as you know, with a lot, of, a lot of legislation is that the Wisconsin lobbying website will allow interest groups on both sides of the aisle uh, or those that are indifferent to the two sides of the aisle um, to, file, uh, to file in favor, against, or indifferent to, to a particular piece of legislation. If you go back 10 years and look at Wisconsin Act 21, which I think was AB 8 um, back then, in the website, you'll note that environmental groups lined up largely against uh, Act 21 being passed and business groups, business associations tended to in large part be those that were in favor. There are a variety of organizations that came out uh, indifferent to it. Um, what I think I, I wanted to, to get your feedback on is 10 years later, looking back in retrospect, um, here we are today with a, Supreme, a series of Supreme Court cases that deal with um, basically business groups and, and environmental groups, including the legislature and the DNR lined up in this in these series of cases. Um, does that surprise you? Could you have anticipated this would happen, that it would be a legislative fight um, or battle and then turn into a judicial or uh, judicial branch battle 10 years later? I don't think it's unusual when you have such a transformative piece of legislation that it is going to go to the courts and get sorted out there. In fact, we saw that over the last decade with a number of those pieces of legislation. You know, I ticked off a few of them here over uh, um, earlier in my comments of um, important pieces of legislation that passed, you know, regardless of where you stand on those issues, um, they were really transformative pieces of legislation. Inevitably, 
those are going to end up in the courts. So I really was not surprised that Act 21 uh, uh, would end up with some court cases. And especially when you have transformative legislation like that, um, there are, you end up with some gray areas that do need to be sorted out. You have the real world that bumps up against that legislative intent. And that is the purpose of the courts to sort that type of thing out. And, and it was not surprising that the environmental groups signed, that they did not care for this because you look at the phosphorus legislation. There was a, uh, in 2010, I'll use that as an example once again, there was a major celebration in the Department of Natural Resources in the summer of 2010 when that administrative rule was put into effect. Environmental groups saw that as a huge success and they celebrated it and they accomplished it by administrative rule. I think they find it much more difficult to accomplish some of these goals when they bring it to their legislators and say, this is what this is going to do. It's much more difficult to do it when you have to go through the legislative process. So, so one question on that, you know, that I guess it deals with two issues. One is, um, you know, in this case, you have uh, a party line vote more or less there. I think there was a Democrat that, that voted for it, an independent that voted for it, I believe. Um, the, the passage, I think, was about 1814 in the Senate in favor, 58 to 34 in the Assembly 10 years ago. Um, but it, again, it's relatively party line if you look at it. Um, and again, the environmental groups lining up against and, and business groups lining up for. Um, you know, one of the questions, I guess, in a state like Wisconsin, where we have, we're, we're privileged to have a lot of wonderful natural resources. Um, I know that you served previously um, on the, you were the chair actually of the Sporting Heritage Mining and Forestry Committee and the North Woods and the area that you serve is, is blessed with a lot of wonderful natural resources that are known across our country, like our forests and our lakes. Um, can you explain a little bit about that tension that exists between conservatives on one side, liberals on the other on this issue and or um, environmental groups and business groups are they mutually exclusive on these issues or is, is this just an area where it's a philosophical debate around governance? So I think it's interesting when uh, I mentioned the shoreline zoning example earlier, that did not line up uh, party line in local politics up in the Senate district that I represented. Um, that very much was people's view of that issue and those that viewed it as not being protective, for example, shoreland zoning changes, if they viewed it as not being protective of the environment, there are some people, regardless of political affiliation, that did not support that. But I think um, ultimately, I just think that environmental groups, both at the state level and the national level, have found that it's easier to go to the regulatory agencies, whether it's EPA at the national level, DNR here at the state level, is to work that process, to work through the administrative rule process. I think they found that easier, that route to go to be easier rather than going the route of having to pass a statute. And I think that's the primary reason why they signed up um, against this. Now, you'll get a different perspective, certainly from those groups, and I don't um, pretend to speak for them, but that was my perception of what was happening there, is um, um, you, you had the environmental groups that wanted that administrative rule process. And by the way, if I could extend my comments a little bit, one of the things that I think you see, one thing that I found after nine and a half years of being in the legislature is that there will be a reaction to legislation that passes. And one of the reactions by the agencies, in particular, I think the Department of Natural Resources, they began to use guidance policy much more after the administrative rule process became difficult. Because I think um, uh, in the run up to my comments here before noon, uh, someone was commenting about, it, it takes a long time for an administrative rule now. And by the way, I believe that's a feature, not a bug. I need, think it needs to really be thought through. It has the force of law. It should have to go through a rigorous process. The governor should have to sign off on it. And, um, um, but I think the offshoot of this 
is the agencies are looking at using guidance policy now um, somewhat as a replacement for the administrative rule process, which used to be much quicker. Great, so I have one last question. Then we have a series of, of audience questions and I think about 17 minutes left. And I know that you're busy at the Rio Grande and so I don't wanna take you way beyond your time here. Um, one of the things that was interesting is back during the passage of this, uh, as you know, various agencies can submit fiscal estimates. Um, Department of Administration for this legislation said it was unknown. Um, the uh, Public Service Commission, um, which regulates utilities and, and energy, uh, they said the increased cost would be about $65,400. The local estimate was indeterminate. Um, I know when Ben talked earlier, he said that you know, this legislation does, in the outcome of this clean Wisconsin case, uh, could have ripple effects at the local level of, of substance, depending on how it is decided. Um, but there's a general sense that the impact would be highly dependent on the volume and nature of rules developed by agencies um, in the aftermath of the passage. So the question that I have, I guess, and, and do you, are you aware of any, any fiscal estimates that have done since then? I know one of the things that uh, people talk about is um, a fiscal estimate to who? Government, businesses, citizens. Um, there are a variety of people that will look at this impact, but have you seen anything in this area that would suggest that it was either unduly burdensome cost-wise or um, a li of limited impact uh, or moderate? So if I'm hearing your question correctly, um, the I, I think that this was one of the more important aspects of the bill. And we were really hoping that there'd have to be a rigorous analysis done by the agencies of how much this is gonna cost um, in, for individuals, businesses, certainly, but also for local units of government. I was really thinking about local units of government who are continually complaining about these unfunded mandates. And this is where this comes in, is with the unfunded mandates. And I thought this was a really important provision in the bill. I don't know if we've used that all that effectively. It takes a lot of work to do a good economic impact analysis, um, but it, it's, it is a place where I believe there is opportunity for the legislature, as well as for citizens in Wisconsin, regardless of where you come from, um, to be able to use that more effectively to figure out how much an administrative rule is going to cost. I do also think that this is part of the reason why you see, you don't see that many administrative rules going through the process anymore. I think this is one of the impediments to that. It takes time to do a good economic analysis. I hope I, I kind of um, hit that a little bit, Eric, as far as the intent of your question. Sure, no, thank you for addressing that. I, you know, I think in the aftermath of a piece of legislation like this, I think people want to know what, what was the cost of it, um, if anything, and the benefits. And so I think that's one of those areas that people are curious about. Yeah, um, it, cer it certainly had an impact on, on the, I know I heard firsthand that um, some agencies were frustrated by the process because obviously it added another layer in there um, of activity that they have to undertake. And um, I think it took a while to kind of figure out how to navigate it. And, um, and I can certainly understand it would take some time with a new process and an agency to be able to figure out how you're going to navigate it. Thank you. So we're at twelve thirty. I think we have about fifteen minutes left. Is that okay with you? If we want, yeah. To I just got to be. I just got to be out of my hotel room by one here, Eric. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, so Brian Bell has a question. I'll read it for you, and you can react to it. As a result of COVID nineteen, many states and the federal government have suspended many administrative rules, and the sp suspension of these rules has not resulted in any negative fallout. Uh, what does Congressman Tiffany suggest the state legislatures and Congress could do to prevent these rules that have proven unnecessary from being implemented, re-implemented? One example that comes to mind is relaxing rules to allow healthcare providers, particularly mental health providers, to practice across state lines. What a great opportunity it is right now to, uh, when you see these administrative rules, which have the force of law, uh, to see that perhaps to review them, to see if they've been effective. And I think this is a golden opportunity for individuals and their legislators to 
review those administrative rules and see if they really have value. And by the way, I've spoken to a couple states since I've moved to my, uh, the federal level here in Congress. I've had a chance to talk to a couple states that do have a rigorous process. Idaho comes to mind. I would urge people to take a look at a couple of those states, in particular Idaho. They review their administrative rules on a regular basis. I think that's something that could be timely here in Wisconsin. You know, you think about after, in the aftermath of Act 21, then you had the RAINS Act that followed about five or six years later, administrative rule reform. I think the next thing that could be done by the legislature, and if I was still in the legislature, that I might be pursuing is giving a regular review of those administrative rules to see if they're keeping up with the times, to see if they're continuing to be effective. That's interesting. Marjorie, earlier today um, from Wayne State University, she, in her research, she found and concluded that collaborative exchanges between states and with the federal government around these issues might be might be helpful and, and it's an under-researched area. So I think it's that's an interesting comment that you make about how states can learn from others. Um, another, another question that I think relates a little bit to an, an earlier conversation that was had here um, was this issue of agency, agencies having particular expertise in a given specialty, uh, whether it's natural resources or utilities or what have you. Um, Cindy Carter asked, please ask Congressman Tiffany why he is not okay with agencies, parentheses, who know what they are doing, um, close parentheses, writing the laws, but he is okay with corporations such as mining companies writing the laws on mining. How does he square that? Yeah, so I'll start from the back there. Um, she listed the example of mining companies writing the law. They did not write the law. That was a vote by the legislature. And ultimately, um, this is about accountability and transparency. And accountability starts with your elected officials. They should have to vote on these policies that have the force of law. And you know, in terms of the philosophical discussion here, that was my frustration coming into the legislature, is that I saw these rules that were being created and you had elected officials, whether in the executive branch or in the legislative branch, that would not, would not take account for it. That would say, that was not, that, not me that did that. And they would each be pointing fingers at each other. It is really important to have that accountability. And uh, I know one of the criticisms of the bill in, uh, um, uh, one of the Dane County legislators, when this was being passed, he said, you're giving all kinds of authority to the governor. Why would you give this authority to the governor? In other words, um, having to sign off on scope statements and things like that. I did not view that as giving power to the governor at all. I saw that as give, making the governor accountable because what I heard from previous governors, both Republicans and Democrats, they would say, well, that's the agency that did that. Well, that agency is under your purview. I thought it was really important for the governor to have to sign off on that, to be accountable, because ultimately then, we the citizens can say, do we want to vote for that person in the future? And that's really what this should um, be all about. If we want to have a functioning, effective democracy, where we hold our elected uh, officials accountable, then we need those people voting on those bills. And we should all be informed. And I know I was informed by people in the agencies. I would talk to them, but I wanted to talk to people with expertise in a whole, um, in many different realms, local officials, businesses, individuals, particular sectors of business. I wanted to talk to all of them to see if it's the best thing to do. Ultimately, it's about accountability at the ballot box. Thank you. Um Marjorie Salba Thompson, who was with us earlier, um, if I could have her join briefly, she did have a comment to make just in her research on the 50 states about Idaho, and she might be able to frame a question around that that she had. Marjorie, are you able to join us? Well, I can't seem to get the video to work, but I think, um, okay, now, now I'm allowed to start my video, okay. <laughs> I had to be reauthorized. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make the point that one of the reasons Idaho is, in our opinion, such an effective state is because they have 
exact partisan balance on their oversight committees. So um, you don't have a review process that then would become a, make things into a partisan football where you, one time you have support for this rule and you, know, you have a different uh, chamber dynamic and you have a uh, different support. So the review process probably would be much more beneficial in states that follow that pattern that Idaho has already adopted. Yeah, if, if I could comment on that, and that's really an interesting comment that Marjorie brings forth there because I did not realize that. But I think the ultimate thing there is that there is a review process. So many states do not have a formalized review process that goes through these on a regular basis. And that might be the best way to go about it is to make it as bipartisan as possible, um, that there are equal numbers. That may be an effective way to go about it. But ultimately, I think the most important thing is that there is a regular review. Yeah, there's, a, um, there's a very interesting study uh, by the Mercatus Center on the states that had sunset review, because what you're talking about is often called a sunset review. There's a regular cycle. Um, and some states even have sunset reviews on the existence of their state agencies. Um, Tennessee at one point almost got rid of their Department of Corrections as a result of a sunset review, but they, they uh, decided at the last minute that they probably needed that because the review was triggered because they were having trouble with private prison operators. And if they had gotten rid of the state agency, all they would have been left with was the, the rationale for criticizing the state agency for not having monitored the vendor better. Um, but the, the Mercatus Institute, um, who actually is fairly supportive of your position, uh, reported that a lot of states found that it was so um, burdensome, um, not, not in terms of, of like the political burdensomeness, but of going through and trying to do the rule, um, you know, sunset clauses, they had to have an awful lot of um, staff on payroll. They had to have a lot of lawyers. They had to have a lot of economists who could actually assess the benefit cost um, questions. That's one of the things that raised for us this concern about the fact that the benefits of rules are often not considered and only the costs are considered. And um, the, the cost um, or the, la the cost of not having the rule, um, Michigan is involved in several million dollars of settlements over the Flint water crisis. Um, <laughs> there's some rules that would have saved the state a heck of a lot of money. Um, you know, so that sort of balance is difficult to strike and is very time consuming. I teach benefit cost as part of an undergraduate class, just a tip of the iceberg. Um, and I've had some graduate coursework years ago in it, and it's very hard to do. That as particularly the benefits tend to be difficult to quantify because they tend to be intangible often um, or non-monetized, what, what are called non-monetized costs. So you have to find shadow pricing. Um, one example of that would be if I'm trying to assess the value of a tree. Um, there was a lovely article in the New York Times about get that oak an accountant. Um, the way you assess the value of a tree to monetize it is to compare two lots being sold by realtors that have different kinds of trees on them. And there are different kinds of trees that are more and less valuable. So then you're, you know, you're seeking all these things of, of what is the beneficial value of a tree. Um, and it's not easy stuff to do. It's just very, very time consuming. So many states just abandoned it because they couldn't get through the rule review process. Um, they were lagging for decades, sometimes um, leading to really heavy costs of trying to gather the information. So it sounds lovely, but in practice, a lot of states gave it up. So um, Eric, I just comment in regards to Marjorie's comments, which um, uh, I find interesting. Wouldn't it be ironic if us conservatives end up building the bureaucracy that we so often rail against 
And uh, it would be the height of irony, wouldn't it? I, I would say conservatives have contributed heavily to the building of the bureaucracy. Well, Congressman, uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. I know you have to get out of your hotel room shortly. I know you have a few minutes to do that. So um, we'd like to, to thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We know you're very busy uh, down at the border. Um, Marjorie, I want to thank you again uh, from Detroit for joining us. This was very interesting to hear the 50 state study um, that you did a couple of years ago. And I think it's very relevant to our discussions today. Um, Justice Geske, Ryan, Ben, um, Delaney as well, who couldn't be with us, unfortunately. I also want to thank you very, very much for this. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tia, my colleague, Tia Westhoff, uh, who will close us out today. Thank you. So again, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, if you'll be seeking CLE credit for the webinar, again, a reminder, just use that Google form link in the chat to submit the three passcodes. On another note, on uh, a final note, I guess, we invite you to join us for more Thompson Center events on these kind of timely topics. We have a busy week coming up with events including historian Doris Kearns Goodwin on leadership in turbulent times this coming Monday night. Scholar Shelby Steele on Freedom in America Today on Tuesday night. We have an excellent panel discussion lined up on Friday, April 16th on the First Amendment on college campuses. And then the following Friday, April 23rd, we'll have a conference on the challenges and opportunities of COVID tracking apps as pandemic control mechanisms. You can find the link to learn more about each of these events in the chat and at our website. Again, uh, we thank you for joining us today. We hope we'll see you again and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.